progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we open the word of the Lord today, shall we ask for his guidance and give him praise for the wonderful way in which he is leading and the manner in which he is instructing us to be prepared for the future. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you with grateful hearts. We thank you for the manner in which you are leading us today, for the instruction that you are giving us, even though we may not fully understand it. Yet, Father, we know that you are in charge, that you are guiding us, and you are directing us so that the light that is behind us is lighting our way to the future. Direct us now, Father, so that we might more clearly understand this light and that our feet may be even more firmly placed upon the path before us. Guide us in this, direct us, be with us. For this we thank you and for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, there was one question that, that was asked yesterday. And it was covered partially in the chat, but I think we need to cover some of this between us openly and directly so that we get a really good understanding of what we're looking at. Does anybody remember what that question was? Okay, that tells me something. So as we go through this, as we have gone through the book of Judges, chapter one, we are finding <clears throat> that there are a group of names of the cities. We need to address some of these names to see if there is any kind of relevance in these cities as way marks for us today. Now, as we look at Judges 1, verse 17, and Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Hormah. So here we have one city with two names. Now, if we, were to, if, if we take this on a step-by-step -step basis, we then come down to where we have Gaza, Ascalon, and Ekron. Now, okay, Gaza, I think we pretty much understand the pronunciation of this one. Ascalon, Ekron. These are three cities that were part of the Philistines because the Philistines had five cities. Okay, so just going back to Zephath and Hormah. So we know that Zephath is watchtower and Hormah means devotion, but it can mean devoted to destruction. Okay. Set apart to destruction. So it's a watchtower that's set aside to destruction. Or it could mean it's a watchtower that's devoted. It could represent the two classes. Okay. Now, what I'm doing as, as we speak, mm -hmm. I'm typing all of this in so that we can then share this on a screen and look at all of the names at one time. So Gaza. <clears throat> Do we have a name? for Gaza? Do we have a, a definition for well, Gaza? Well, it means the strong, the mighty, the greedy, the fierce, the powerful, etc. And it's it's actually Aza, but Okay. You know, it's it starts with a, um, an Ein, so it's Gaza. Okay. But yeah, they have it as Gaza. Anyway. And Okay, Ascalon. Um, well, it's, uh, I shall be weighed, 
is one of the meanings, meanings of it. The fire of infamy it has here. Um, so it comes from the word to weigh. So I'm not sure how they get the fire of infamy. Uh, but, but you know, thou art weighed in the balances and found, found wanting, that kind of idea. Right. This could come from it. And um, Ekron means torn up by the roots. Um, it can also mean emigration. And uh, so the main word that it comes from uh, means to pluck up a car, um, dig down, how, pluck up, root up, or ho, I guess that is. How do you pronounce the word H O U G H? Huff. Huff? Huff. Okay. So that's how you pronounce it. Is that how it's supposed to be pronounced? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, those are words I find pretty tough to figure out how to pronounce. Okay. What, so, Huff, you've used that word before? I've seen it in other in, in other places when I read it. That's not something I use commonly. It also means hamstring. I think we ran into this before. We did. Yeah. So you <coughs> huff the horses that is cut mm -hmm. by hamstrings. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we did run into this before. Okay, Hebron. Um, so, uh, so where's Hebron? Where do, where do I see Judges that? 120. Okay, there it is. Because Hebron had two names, right? Yeah, it was Luz at the first. What, no, that's Bethel that was Luz. What was Hebron first? Uh, um. Now the word is actually uh, Heber. That's or it's based on the word Heber, right? Uh, the name Heber, which is society, okay. a society, a charmer, company, enchantment. So it's got kind of strange uh, words. So it has to do with association. Um, I guess you know, sort of like a medium, maybe that type of idea. So okay. where that might come from the, the idea that it's a charmer. Um, yeah, so it comes from the name Heber, but it's Hebron, which just means it's of Heber. Um, so that's all I have there, just association. <coughs> okay. Um, the seat of association. Okay, so Jabusi. And that's in which verse? Okay, when when we're talking here of Judges 121, we're going to come to this again because they identify this as Jabusi and that they had inhabited Jerusalem. So if we were looking at this oh. portion. Okay, so Jebusi, that just means the Jebusites, descendants of Jebus. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jebus probably means trodden, uh, like a threshing, a threshing floor or a threshing place. Okay. Um, and yeah, and, and there was there is an association between a threshing floor and Jerusalem. Okay. And do we, do we have a definition of Jerusalem? Uh, well, there's different definitions for Jerusalem, but, uh, you know, it's the city of peace or the teaching of peace is generally Yerushalayim is the pronunciation. Um, so, of course, you're going to have Shalom, peace, which is part of the name. Okay. And uh, Yara, which means a number of different things, but basically to throw or to flow. 
Um, but it also can refer to like an arrow to shoot an arrow. Okay. To point a finger. Um, but it also means to inform, instruct. So that's more metaphorically, I guess, to teach. Um, and of course, shalom, peace. Which is a type of reconciliation of peace. Okay. There's different types of peace. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, shalom, shalom means to make, make amends. It's basically rec, rec, restitution, restore, reward. Lots of different meanings, but it's it's the idea of security and safe safety because of where there had been, I guess, conflict. Okay. So the fire of uh, dealing with the writing on the wall, it was written on with with a finger in fire. So there's a note there in the chat. Maybe that's the fire of infamy. So if you can think about it, it be, means to weigh, right? So that would connect us to the writing on the wall. Uh, weighed in the balances and found wanting. Okay, now that was that was in regarding to which one? Um, fire. Ascalon. Ascalon. Okay. Which also means right, so it means Wayne or the fire of infamy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, <clears throat> to to go back just a second, um, Hebron. If we were looking at Genesis twenty three two, we would find a definition there because that is the town or near the town where Sarah died. And it was called Kirjath Arba at the beginning. Kirjath Arba. So the city of the four giants is what okay. it means. Because Kirjath is city. Ha Arba means four. Arba means four. The four. Okay. City of the four, literally. Uh, the giants is... Um, what it's referring to. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we were we were addressing Jebusi in Jerusalem. Bethel, as we've spoken of many times before, is the house of God. Mm -hmm. Because Beth is house of El God. Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of Luz? Um, which is actually, I believe, Lutz, but um, oh, it's Lutz. Not let me see here. I have nut tree or almond tree, which reminds me of Aaron's rod that budded, of course. That's yeah, an almond tree. Okay. okay, the reason for all of this participation is that when we get through these different names, what I'd like to do is to look at this and see if we can't see any kind of a connection with things that God may be working to tell us regarding some of the original names and then the names to which these areas and these cities were changed. So I'm trying to play a game. <clears throat> okay, so we've now come through Luz, we've come through Bethel. That should be, uh, what else? Um, we're gonna come down here. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheon and her towns, nor Tanakh, nor Dor, nor Iblim, nor Megiddo, that the Canaanites dwell in the land. So Beth Sheon is the house of something. The house of ease. Okay.
and Tanakh. Well, it means uh, who, hum who humbles thee or who answers thee? Tanakh? Yeah, that's what Strong says. I don't know. Hmm. I don't have Strong saying anything. Hmm. I wonder if Strong I jumped to something just else. Has an uncertain derivation. A place in Palestine. Okay, well. But, um, or maybe I look it up. Yeah. Um, Brown Drivers Briggs has Sandy. Okay. I have. Uh, she will afflict. Wandering through castle. Where Where do you get that one from? The exhaustive dictionary of Bible names. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> you said Sandy or Castle? Well, I said she will afflict is the first one. Then it says wandering through. Wandering through. And then Castle. Okay. <clears throat> Door, D O R. What do we have here? <clears throat> I did not get somewhere. Dwelling, dwelling, revolution of time, age, generation, posterity. All right. <clears throat> I blame. I blame. Devouring people. Devouring as in eating, as in destroying. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, now we come to this with Ephraim. Uh, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelled in Gezer. G-E-Z-E-R. From Gezer, however that is pronounced. Yeah, it means a portion. Like to cut off a portion, a part, or a piece. Okay. Ketron, which nor the inhabitants of Nahalal. Yes. So Ketron, it means incense. Um, it's the, actually the idea of the fumigation of a close, a close place, and perhaps thus driving out the occupants to smoke. It is to turn into into fragrance by fire especially as an act of worship, to burn incense sacrifice upon an altar. That's where it comes from. So, um, and then. Okay. And then Nahala. Yes. Which means pasture. Pasture. Yeah, pasture. Okay. Like the bush. Okay. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akhol, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor of Ahalab, nor of Akzib, nor of Halba, 
nor of Afik, nor of Rehob. So this one has quite a few different areas. Mm -hmm. What do we find here? Echo means straightness. So because it's its situation is on a bay. Okay. So and, and Zidon, well, I mean hunting is in fishing. Again on the coast. Um, Aklab means fatness or fertile place. That's the idea of fatness, something that's prosperous. Exceed, uh, deceitful. And falsehood, liar, lie. That's where it comes from. Helba is fertile, which also means to be fat. So it's actually Helba. And So it's actually related to the word alchab. So they come from the same root. Uh, let's see. Okay. So alchab and helba both come from the same word, Hebrew two four five nine. That's why they mean the same thing. And then afek means a fortress or an enclosure. And the idea is to, com uh, to contain, that is abstain, force oneself or restrain oneself. That's the root that it comes from. And rehab, rehob, um, is a, a broad place. Okay. So it's kind of the opposite of of Akko, because you have one that's a straight place, and the other one that's a broad place. So if the, basically we, we wind up with a, a comparison here. So yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now. So it's interesting here, just these ones, you, you could almost make them into like a chiasm. Yes, you could. It's with Asher. Yeah. When we're looking at this, it, it becomes interesting to see the name of these areas compared with the characters that Jacob saw in his various sons. So. Okay, <clears throat> as we continue down.
So we see that the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. House of the sun. Okay. Now, Anoth, um, so we got Beth Anoth. Beth Anoth, Beth Aneth, however you want to say that. But that one means house of affliction um, or replies. Or response. Okay. So Naphtali made them into tributaries. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not allow them to suffer them to come down into the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Heres, in Ajalon, and in Shablin. So do we take this as the name of a mountain, the name of a city, and the name of a second city? Would that be the way we'd look at this? Yeah, Mount Heres, which is the shining mount, um, which is like the sun. So the idea is the sun there. Because uh, Harry's is um, um, can refer to the shining of the sun. Okay. Also means itch, but the the root word, but. <clears throat> So Mount Harry's in Agilon. And so what is that? What's, what's Agilon? Uh, well, it's the field of deer is what the word means. Okay. And how about Shalbim? Um, it's a place of foxes. Um, Shaul means fox or jackal. It's just em is plural. Okay. So all of this was part of this. <laughs> Okay, so the Amorites forced the children of Dan to the mountain, but we don't really have anything there as far as cities. But these next cities, it says the hand of the house of Joseph. So would we say Ephraim here? Yeah, so the house of Joseph refers to Ephraim. Okay. So, so Dan doesn't conquer these, but, but Ephraim does. Is that what it's saying? That's the way I'm taking it. Okay. And the coast of the Amorites was from the going up to Akrabim, from the rock and upward. And all it gives us here was Mala Akrabim. Yeah, so maybe means a scorpion. So scorpion. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. So, Ma'ale um, Akrabim, mm -hmm. Steep of Scorpions, or the Ascent or Going Up of Akrabim in Hebrew. So, going up to Akrabim, so the Ascent. So, not from the rock and upward. Okay. I'm not sure what place it's describing there. So that's the border of the Amorites. Okay. And so that portion, that hands us some of these, these pieces of information. Okay, so... Um, Scrolling back for a minute, so go ahead and keep talking. Yeah, so um, just this is uh, Adam Clark's commentary on this. Uh, talking about acrobeam of scorpions, probably so called from the number of those animals in that place. Uh, says from the rock and upward, and some people understand this to be the city of Petra, which was the capital of Arabia Petria. Um. So I don't know if that's correct or not, but that's kind of interesting. Yeah, so the from the rock from so they are just saying that this refers to the city of Petra. This is Albert Barnes, the capital of Idumea so-called from the mass of precipitous rock which encloses the town and out of which many of its buildings are excavated the original word sila is always used of the rock so sila is the the hebrew word there um uh, which is always used of the rock of kadesh barnea near petra and you can look at Obadiah 1, verse 3. It says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou art thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground. And Numbers 28 to 11. Take the rod and gather the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock so they shall give the congregation and their beasts to drink so it's just referring to that that word there so whatever that means i'm not really sure okay but yeah so the word rock is is sela or shela depending on how you pronounce it sela i guess it's sela it's not an SH, it's an S. Sila. Okay. So I don't. So from the going up of the scorpions, from the rock and upward, or from Petra and upward. And and both of these, these going ups from the going up, upward is the same as it's the same word basically as from the going up even though it gives a slightly different number, alel, that one just has a different suff uh, suffix. But it's basically the same word. Okay. So... Give me just a moment and then I'll share with you what I have just done. Okay. Okay. 
kind of interesting here. When we're when we're taking a look at this, I'm intrigued by a couple of items that I'm seeing, and I want to put this on the on the screen for everybody else to uh, to comment on. Okay. Just a moment. Kind of interesting when we pull these names together. And we start looking at different points. So I have to save this a couple of different ways. I don't want to lose what we just did. Okay. Okay. Can you see that before you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're dealing with the with Simeon. Judah went with his brother Simeon. So we're we're going to use that Simeon had asked for the help of Judah to take Zelphath, which later became known as Horma. Judah took control of Gaza, Ascalon, Ekron, and Kerjath Arba, which was then called Hebron. Now I'm placing what Caleb did with Judah because Caleb was of the tribe of Judah. Jebusi or Jerusalem was within Benjamin. It is also stated as being something that was under the control of Judah. Now we come to the tribe of Joseph taking Luz or Bethel. But as you have stated in the past, the tribe of Joseph is also a euphemism for Ephraim, right? Mm -hmm. Manasseh was responsible for Beth Shean, Tanakh, Dor, and Eblium. Again, Ephraim is mentioned, dealing with Gezer. Mm -hmm. Then we come to Zebulun with Kitron and Nahal. Asher is the one that is given the most number of cities noted. 
Then we have Naphtali. And again, we come to Ephraim. So why three different ways is Ephraim being addressed within this as far as taking the cities or not taking the cities? Well, I mean, they're, they're doing this in a certain order, like uh, geographically. Right. Ephraim has a much larger territory. So when we come down or we come back to the beginning with the meanings of the name, we have this watchtower. And the name is changed then to devotion. Now, this is a watchtower that could have been committed to destruction. We have Gaza, the strong and the mighty. Ascalon, I shall be weighed, the fire of infamy. Ekron, torn up by the roots. Kurjoth Arba, the city of the four giants. Or we have society and charmer where its name is changed when we start looking at just these first five cities has not the church and the movement been a type of a watchtower mm -hmm. And of course, Horma devotion means could mean devoted to destruction or for worship. Right. Exactly. So, so the two classes. But then we have this as the strong and the mighty being weighed. And as we were addressing, is this also weighed in the balance? Mm-hmm. Is it also not when you're weighed in the balance, are you not torn up by the roots? Mm -hmm. So city of the four giants. Does this relate to different portions, different tenants that people have held on to within the church but that are proving to be of no effect as we continue to study i mean we've heard lots of lip service to the 2300 to the 1260 to the 1290 to the 1335 but how many times are these prophecies as they have been laid out how many times have they had an effect upon the lives of people to where they understand and look to understand further the implications of all of these prophecies within their lives i mean so many have chosen to set aside the seven times because somebody in the church has said no this this is past and it's not something we believe in anymore. When we look at some of these other names, do we really wish to be living in Beth Shean, the house of ease? Is that what we're called for? Is that what we're called to? So, I just look at, at all of these situations with all of these names and I'm asking, does this have some type of a prophetic application for us today? Yeah, well, you look at House of Ease, Sandy, you know, your house built upon the sand, revolution of time, referring to the generations and a devouring people. So what are they devouring? Well, pretty much each other. Right. But are they also not devouring 
a food that makes them weak. Well, I mean, yeah, it could refer to lots of different things. They're devouring not just food, but just the things that, you know, the things of this world. Comment from the chat. The house of the four giants. Could that be four generations of Adventism? Could it be four celebrities or four favorite tenants or policies or proverbs? There are so many things that God is working to show us here. And my, my big question with these cities and with their names, do, does the fact that these tribes failed in taking control of, the, of their inheritance, especially with the descriptions that are given of these cities, does this have an interrelationship with the characters that were ascribed by Jacob to each of these sons? What I will do is I'll send this along and we should consider some of this in our studies over the next few days. A uh, comment that was made here again, Devouring people, Psalms 14.4, which is interesting because of the numerical application here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it says, have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord. This reminds me of the GC always wanting the money to come to them instead of to the field where people were actually doing the work. Okay. I find it interesting that in this, as we go through this list of the different cities, that so far we only have four of all of these cities that have had their names changed. And they may have been changed later. So. Okay. So that's the portion that I have and that I was led to look at here. Now, in all of this that we looked at in the first chapter of Judges, the overriding theme that I'm seeing is that the tribes did not walk by faith, they walked by sight. For had they walked by faith, they would have been able to have driven out the inhabitants of the land in each of their territories. What does this represent for us today? What warning can we see here? Are we not being shown that we need to have complete and total reliance that the word of God that has been given will do just exactly as the word of God has promised? Mm -hmm. Amen. We don't need to fear. the pastors with their amazing degrees. We don't need to fear the conference, the union, the general conference, all of these things. 
that keep telling us that, well, you need someone that's an expert in Greek and Hebrew to explain these passages to you. There are definitions here, yes, that we need, we need some help with from time to time. But why do we need a priest to explain to us scripture? When I first heard that a pastor that I know well was telling a friend of mine that you need an expert in Greek and Hebrew to explain to you what the Bible means, that to me was no different than many of the things that have come from the mouth of Catholic priests and prelates that people are too dumb to understand scripture and that they need someone that is trained to explain it. When we look at these things and we compare verse upon verse, we can find the meaning that God would have us to understand just as Father Miller did. Any disagreement with that? No. And I mean, Hebrew and Greek is, is helpful at times. Yes, I agree. Uh, but when you compare scripture with scripture, I mean, part of what we do when we look at a, a Hebrew or Greek word, we have some tools that we use, ESORD, as these dictionaries and so forth, but we can compare the scriptures. And, and like a lexicon, like Brown Drivers Briggs or Jesenius, um, the usefulness of that tool is it points out uh, verses that use the same word. So you can compare those, those words in different places. And another tool that I use is uh, uh, the, uh, the King James Concordance, which compares the Hebrew word. So if you look in English, you might see uh, a word, but it could have different Hebrew words or Greek words that that are translated as that word. But when you use the, the King James Concordance on Strong's, um, it will just show you all the verses that use that Hebrew word or Greek word. Mm -hmm. So it's really useful. So if you look up like scorpions, for instance, um, you're going to find all the places that word is used. You'll see it in Ezekiel, you'll see it in Second Chronicles, in First Kings, in Numbers, in Judges. But those are just tools. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives us the understanding of the scriptures. And so often you have people who are educated, and they believe that they're the interpreters of right. God's word. And yet they may have certain tools that they can use, like their study of the language and the grammar. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is obedience to God's word. And, and often they will reject the plain reading of scripture because of some human uh, sophistry that totally negates what's being said. And one of my favorite, if you want to call it that, is where um, they use the word perfect when Jesus talks about uh, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. And they do this error where they say, well, the perf the word perfect means mature. And so this is just plainly talking about maturity. Um, but when they're doing that, they're using equivocation, which is to use one meaning of a word and then exchange it for another meaning of that same word, because the obvious thing is that maturity refers to perfection. It doesn't refer to just, you know, being mature in the sense of grown up. So, you know, so I'm, I'm always amazed at, you know, somebody being educated and, and yet the plain things of the scripture, they can set aside. You know, he that says, I know God and keeps not his commandments is a liar. It's pretty straightforward in, in 1 John that um, 
he that knows God does not commit sin. Right? If you say that you've commit sin, if you commit sin, you don't know God. And, and that would mean that all of us really don't know God. And yet Amen. people think that they know God because they know things about God. But we're not, we don't reflect his character. And yet people will dismiss those types of verses because they go contrary to their natural desires. Yeah, John, First uh, John 3, verse 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed, that is God's seed, remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Okay. You know, everything that, that you just said, I agree with. I can't disagree with it. We need to understand this and we need to be able to walk by faith. It is the one thing that we're going to have to be able to do that where the children of Israel and their descendants had failed. Mm -hmm. Now, hmm. that open. Interesting. So let's go to this. Okay. Bear with me for just a moment. Okay, so I'm going to close this. Okay, so I need to get this. Interesting. I don't know why, but I cannot seem to get Judges 2 to share. Hmm. So you have the they have the file open? I have the file. I have the file open and it just doesn't seem to want to share. Okay. What I'm going to do for the remaining minutes, I'm going to read the first two verses of Judges chapter 2. And we're okay. going to op open this for discussion because it's, to me, it's very interesting as to, as to what this is showing. So I'll just go here. I'll share, share Judges chapter 2. Okay. Ready? Can you see it there? I see it. Okay. Okay. So, Judges chapter 2. 
as I was led to prepare for this. Judges chapter 2, in the first verse, we see that this is an angel rebuketh the people at Bochim for their disobedience to God's command. Verse 6, during the life of Joshua and of the elders who survived him, the people served the Lord. Verse 10, but in the next generation fall away to grievous idolatry. Verse 14, God's anger against them. Verse 16, his pity toward them in their distress and their ungrateful behavior. Verse 20, the Canaanites are therefore left to prove Israel. Verse 1, and an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land, and ye shall throw down their altars but ye have not obeyed my voice, why have ye done this? This angel, or as would be also translated this messenger, has come up from Gilgal to Bochim. The question becomes, in these two verses, who is speaking? Well, well, this is Christ. It has to be Christ. Uh -huh. Why has he come up from Gilgal? Well, we know that that's where the sanctuary was at first, though now it has moved to um, Shiloh. But is, is not Gilgal where the king was selected? Or am I thinking of something else? Um, okay, so Gilgal is mentioned, uh, let me see, it's all through Joshua, yeah, yeah, that's where they're going to, uh, so in, uh, 1 Samuel 7, 16, he went from year to year to circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mitzvah and judged Israel in those places. So this is a reference to Samuel, I believe. Right. And um, then said Samuel to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. All the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king. So that's what you're referring to. And I believe there were others that went up to Gilgal as well. Now here, we also have this warning in 1 Samuel 10, 8. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. Mm -hmm. This was Samuel preparing to give an instruction to Saul, right? Yeah. So Gilgal has an importance. It has something that we are to recognize. What is Gilgal? What is the meaning of Gilgal? Well... It's um, a wheel or a rolling. A wheel. Okay. 
is this something that we can interrelate with Ezekiel's wheels? Or is this like a, a wheel as in a grinding stone? Well, probably you could apply both symbols. Okay. So, as we look at this, when Christ came up from Gilgal to Bokin, Bokin meaning the weepers, correct? Yeah. Why would he be coming from the wheel to the weepers? What symbolism do we see here? I mean, the warning is clear. This is Christ. Yeah. So one of the things about uh, this wheel, Gilgal, so every place it refers to the city except one, um, and that's Isaiah 28, 28. Okay. So Isaiah 28, 28 says, um, well, this is in that, that whole chapter dealing with um, uh, the, the line, line upon line and so forth, right? Right. Okay. So, um, and then it says, uh, 23, give ye ear and hear my voice, hearken and hear my speech. Doth the plowman plow all, all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin and cast the principal wheat and the appointed barley and the rye in their place? For his God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him, for the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither a cartwheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with the staff and the cumin with the rod or cumin, I guess. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Cumin. Yeah, okay. Bread, bread corn is bruised because he will not ever be threshing it nor break it with the wheel of his cart. Now, this is a different word than the wheel, the cart wheel in the verse before. Right. Which is the word ofan. Evolve. And uh, which is kind of interesting in and of itself. But anyway, with its wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with the horseman. So here you get the word Gilgal, um, the wheel of his cart. So this has to do with understanding truth and the things that are being ground is, is the Bible. So you can see that this wheel, Ezekiel's wheel within wheels, which at first looks complicated, um, shows perfect order when studied. And, and this is really telling us to study God, God's word and to 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 prepare the soil, to plow, to plant the seed, and then and then and then you have the harvest, right? In which it has to be, um, and and then you have to take this this grain and you have to uh, do all the processing of it. So that's basically what we're doing. I find it interesting that, that we're addressing this verse given the symbolism that we would see in the number of the verse. Right, 28-28. So. Well, it's not, it, it's not just 28-28. It's also four times, four times. Right. So, so it's, it's, yeah, it's seven times four, seven times four. So it's two 25-20s symbolically represented if we want to look at it that way because the four seven times 
twice and then doubled. Right. Yeah. So that makes sense. So what we're dealing with here is not only a repeat of the second angel's message, it's mm -hmm. also how we are to come unto understanding the second angel's message and take it and make it a part of our message, the message that should have been going out since 1888. Because if we do not understand the first and the second, we're never really going to truly understand the third. Mm -hmm. So anyway, going back to judges. Okay. So he comes from Gilgal to Bokum. From the wheel to the weepers. Yeah, so that reminds me of Psalm 126. Okay. And um, which I remember because I wrote it as a scripture song. But uh, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So this again relates to the same symbolism but this time with the 1260 instead of the 2520 as such. And, um, and the idea of sowing seed and reaping. But here it's those that sow in tears, right? So that's the weeping. Um, and, and the word weepeth here is baka, which is just the singular bokeem. So it's the same word. It's it, it's an interesting application that you're making here. Mm -hmm. Because that would be that would be tying in judges two one and two two. With this, with Isaiah 28, 28, four times, four times, with Psalms 126, which is 1260, which is a portion of the, of, of the seven times. Right. And it's also a symbol of the 2520 from Daniel chapter five. Right. All of these things are interconnected. Mm -hmm. Now, as we look and we ponder upon this, especially as we're going to be pondering upon these verses for today, mm -hmm. what other symbols are we going to be able to find as we look through this? What is this going to mean for us in the movement today? Because here, in the second verse and ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land again the word given to moses and the word given through joshua is repeated mm -hmm. you are to make no league with the inhabitants of this land yet in the history of the movement how many times do we find that a league has been made with the inhabitants of the land? I didn't have it counted, but well, a few times. <laughs> okay. Elder Jeff was being very clear. 
when there was the one of the one of the first divisions that occurred came up because of the book of Joel. Yeah. Those that chose to separate at that time had chosen to make use of an old commentary for their understanding of Joel. Was this not making a league? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, commentaries can be useful, but I'm, I'm but, not disagreeing um, with you. But the idea of taking just because the commentary has said it, even though the arguments against their position were strong, didn't really make much sense with me or to me. Doesn't make sense. Um, and especially then to oppose the movement. Exactly. Yeah, saying that they were the ones doing the right thing. I mean, it's pretty obvious now that they weren't because they, they pretty much all fall, fallen away. But, you know, people do those types of things all the time. Well, and, when, when we come down to the situation of what had occurred in Germany, mm -hmm. where you have Parminder and Tess deciding that they can indiscriminately tell people that if you won't change your opinion, we're going to throw you out. Or to come to the ladies and say that we're setting aside the health message. And it, you know, this is the way you should dress. Is that that is that not just another version of a league with those of the land? what else do we see so as we consider these two verses for the balance of today let us bring some of these considerations back for first thing tomorrow okay let us then begin to walk through judges chapter two to see exactly what this chapter is telling us for our time today. Because if the Lord is coming up from Gilgal to Bokeh and is reminding us of all of the things that his word has promised, is this not something that where we need to pay attention? Is this not an area that is worthy of our consideration? Uh -huh. Okay, any other comments or thoughts? Okay. Shall we pray? Loving Father, I thank you for the opportunity of being able to come before you. Father, I have sinned, I am not worthy. I need your guidance and I need your direction. I do not wish to walk by sight. I need to have faith that your word will do exactly as your word has promised. In this, direct me today. Direct us each one in the path that you would have us to follow. We thank you for this study time. We thank you for this time that you have allowed, that you have brought us together 
so that we can consider the examples that you are providing. Be with us now. May all that is done today bring glory to your name. For this we thank you and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Recording stopped.